Welcome to our online service as we join with those in church who are following the service at 10.30. The preacher this morning is Ross Ferguson, who is the pastor of Lincoln Baptist Church, and we thank him as he opens God's word for us as we continue our journey through John's Gospel. It's our prayer meeting this Wednesday, the 16th of September at 7.45. Join us in church by booking your place on Eventbrite and you can find the link on the website. Or join us on Zoom as usual. Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7 says, Oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are His people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Let us pray. Thank you that we can join together now, still and open our hearts and minds as we meet together now with you. Amen. Now I just want to hand over to our worship group as they lead us. Blessing and honour, glory and power be unto the ancient of days From every nation, all of creation Bow before the ancient of days Every tongue in heaven and earth Shall declare your glory Every knee shall bow at your throne In worship you be exalted, O God shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Blessing and honour, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory Every knee shall bow at your throne In worship you'll be exalted, O God And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you'll be exalted O oh God and your kingdom shall not pass away O oh, ancient of days O oh, ancient of days O oh, ancient of days There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, but one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Oh, how grace abounds! We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. Pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the light. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He 
He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. So come and be chainless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary For there is redemption For every affliction Here at the foot of Calvary Come along now, my friends. Come and see today's special offers. I have loaves of bread made only yesterday. Many, many bargains. Much cheapness. Come along to Amos Goldberg's Any Product Emporium. Ah, shalom, my friends. It is certainly getting harder here to earn an honest living. Well, okay then, to earn a living, if you know what I mean. There have been fewer and fewer customers these last few days looking at my bargains. I mean, take those melons. I wish someone would. They're not going to last much longer. It's already three days since they fell off the back of old Isaac Gallius' cart. And I can tell you, that fall did not do them any good at all. I would have to put a smaller rock in front of the wheel of the cart next time so the goods are not so badly damaged when I am trying to sell them. Look at these bargains, people. Nice ripe melons. Special offer today. Buy one, get one free. I am giving my stock away. Also available, tasty loaves of bread. Mind you, I'm sure this buy one, get one free lark won't catch on at all. Anyway, as I was saying, business has been slack these last few days. All the crowds have been gathering over to the other side of the town, listening to some preacher called Jesus speaking. Old Ezra Zechariasen has been studying his scrolls. And he reckons this Jesus is something special. He might even be the promised Messiah. So, yesterday, I went myself. Business was slow, so I packed up the stall early. Besides, I had to get those melons out of the direct sunlight. They were ripening very, very quickly. It didn't take long to find where Jesus was. I just headed to where the large crowd was gathered. There were many, many people there. Some said about 5,000 men. So I joined the crowd. After a while, people started to feel hungry and no one had brought any food. Oh, I wouldn't have had enough on my stall to sell to everyone either. Then the disciples managed to find some loaves of bread and some fish. Not much for this big crowd, but somehow Jesus managed to not only feed everyone, but there was plenty left over. In fact, there was so much before it was all collected up, I managed to pick up several loaves to bring to sell on my stall. So today I have fresh bread for sale. However, first thing this morning, the crowd were looking for some more free food. 
Jesus was nowhere to be found. So they rushed past my stall without even looking at the bread I was selling and got into a boat to sail to Capernaum to look for him. Why would they buy my bread when yesterday he had given them free bread? Oh, well, people have started coming back now and they are complaining. They are still hungry. So Jesus didn't feed them today. Ezra Zechariasen, however, when he returned, was very, very excited. Ezra said he thought Jesus was the one God was speaking about when he told Moses he would raise up a prophet from among their fellow Israelites. God will put words into his mouth and he will tell the people everything God commands him. In fact, God told Moses that he would personally deal with anyone who will not listen to what he was saying on his behalf. Ezra told me that Jesus had said to the people they had only followed him because he gave them food. He also told them how they should be looking for food that nourishes their lasting life. And what he does is guaranteed by God the Father to last. He told them how the bread that Moses had fed the people with in the desert was bread from heaven. And now the Father was offering them the real bread from heaven. Well, people jumped at that and asked him to give them bread for now and forever. Then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry again. Well, Ezra was excited at this, but most of the people were not. They said to themselves, we know his father and his mother. How can we believe him when he says he came down from heaven? Ezra said they had all missed the point. Yesterday, when Jesus fed everyone, he had demonstrated that God not only met their needs, but demonstrated he is overflowingly abundant with all the baskets that he filled at the end. They wanted the everlasting bread he offered, but they did not want what he was saying. I do not think this is the last we have heard of this, my friends. Ezra is very excited, but many, many people are not. I cannot see this Jesus going quietly, especially if, as Ezra says, he is the one that God promised Moses he would send to tell the people about him. Well, I had better get back to selling my goods. Those melons are not going to last much longer. Shalom, my friends. Well, thank you Amos for your unique account of those events. The crowd had gathered that day because they had seen miracles. They saw miracles which caused them to follow Jesus and they saw the miracle which had fed them just the day before and they were searching for more miracles. However, no miracle would ever be enough. What they failed to realise was that the greatest miracle was actually standing in front of them. God had come to live among his people, to live and to die for them, so they could live with him in heaven. But they didn't see this because they were hungry for earthly things. Bread or other food only satisfies us for a relatively short period of time, but then we get hungry again. Jesus, being the bread of life, can give us life now and forever. Everyone who believes in Jesus can have this eternal life. I will see the world to come For one has suffered in my place Now there is grace awaiting me Awaiting me Judgment's done, 
Atonement's made, the ransom's paid, and no guilt remains. Now there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me. Grace, a welcome from the Father. Grace, forgiveness full and free. Grace that's greater than our failings. Oh, there is grace awaiting me. I take comfort in the hope of the thief upon the cross. For I am worthy of as little love as he. This man, I won't despair For life's ahead, or what joy we'll share Now there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me Grace, a welcome from the Father Grace, forgiveness full and free It's greater than our failings Oh, there is grace awaiting me Jesus, you have loved and bought me By your death my debts are paid I am yours, I stand Beside you, fearless, face the coming day. I will see the world to come, despite the sin that I have done. For there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me. And all who call upon the Lord will rise to life. Assured, for there is grace awaiting me, awaiting me. Grace, a welcome from the Father. Grace, forgiveness full and free. Grace that's greater than our failings. Oh, there. Grace awaiting me Grace a welcome from the Father Grace forgiveness full and free Grace that's greater than our failings Oh there is grace Awaiting me Oh, there is grace Awaiting me Let us pray The splendour of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice you wrap yourself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at your voice. May we tremble at your voice, O Lord. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age you stand, and time is in your hands, beginning and the end. All things are in your hands, O Lord. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, and all will see how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, our hearts will sing how great is our God. You're the name above all names, you are worthy of our praise, our hearts will sing how great is our God. Father, we come before you as sinners in need, we confess our sin before you. 
Your word says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot understand it. You know us more fully than we know ourselves. Lord, if you mark such transgressions, who would stand? But thanks by your grace, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavour, but by the blood of the Lamb. We give thanks for the many things you bless us with. Your grace and your love poured out for us in abundance. That you lavish upon us through the Lord Jesus. Thank you to you that there is more grace in the Lord Jesus than sin in us. Thank you for your care and all that you provide. Help us to be always thankful. We bring before you our church family for those struggling and weak. Thankful that the Lord Jesus is gentle and lowly. You comfort us. For you comfort those in need. For your word says, Come to me, all who, are all who labour and are in levy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We lift before you Jeremy Bass after the passing of his mum. Be with the family at this time. We pray for Charles Hill as they prepare for the funeral and pray for Andrew as he leads the service. May you be glorified through this. We lift up Chris and Morris Thornley at this time as they struggle with health issues. May they know your help in times of need. We pray for Ross as he comes to bring your word to us. Help us to hear, have ears to hear and speak, we pray. We continue to pray for the leadership team. Give them wisdom at this time and strengthen them. We give thanks that they have been able to meet in person. We pray for the unity for us as a fellowship and for the leadership. May we long for the time when we can meet one in this life or the next. We pray for our world in need. Help us to put our trust firmly in you, Lord, and not in the things of this world, whether person or created things. Help us to cling to you, knowing that your grip is ever more stronger. In all the troubles of this country, come, Lord Jesus. So will you grant us never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, and the exceeding glory of Christ the exceeding beauty of holiness and the wonder of grace. We pray all these things in your holy and glorious name, for your glory. Amen. Free 
for God the just is satisfied to look on him and Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and Today's reading is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 22 to 34. I am the bread of life. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the lake saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into their boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do? to be doing the works of God. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Or as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. We come now to the Word of God and we're going to be heading to John's Gospel and chapter 6. So go ahead, grab your Bibles and head to the Gospel of John. If you're new to the Bible, you'll find it in the New Testament. It is that that latter third of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospel of John. And the passage we're going to be considering is from verse 22. But before jumping into verse 22, halfway through the chapter, it's really good for us to reflect on where the chapter has gone so far so we can bring verse 22 to onwards into context. So with chapter 6 open in front of you, at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000, this miraculous event written in all four of the Gospels. Jesus completes this miracle by taking a small amount of food and miraculously spreading it across the entire 5,000 so that all ate and all were satisfied. 
At the completion of this miracle, Jesus then sends his disciples to go ahead of him to travel across the Sea of Galilee. While on this journey, the disciples run into problems. In fact, they're caught in a major storm. This is the, the second time that they've been caught in a major storm on the Sea of Galilee that would threaten their lives. It is at this moment that Jesus, seeing from afar, seeing his disciples in struggle, walks on water towards them. Astounded, the disciples see Jesus coming in, not really sure what is happening at this stage, but Jesus gets into their boat and the storm is calmed. All seems like it's going well because a few moments later, they arrive on the coast at the other side of the Sea of Galilee and go to Capernaum, that coastal town that they were heading towards. And so we see these two fantastic things happening at the beginning of chapter six, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. And what we're seeing in chapter six is that Jesus operates outside of normal earthly living. He can miraculously cause food to multiply and the wind and the sea obey his voice. Jesus is no ordinary prophet or teacher because nature itself obeys the words of Jesus. And as we pick up the text today, what I'm going to show you is that the intended response of faith in Jesus isn't actually forthcoming. In fact, the wonders that Jesus has been showing and performing in front of the people divide the people into two camps, those who believe and those who don't. As we go through today's text, I want you to see that a very simple yet profound truth. New life comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. It might sound fairly simple to you. It might even seem obvious to you. Yet in this profound truth, so many of us struggle to understand it, that new life comes from faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone. So we're going to begin our passage looking from verse 22 onwards. Join with me, John 6 verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. The verses prior to 22 focus specifically on what was happening with the disciples and Jesus, that uh, moment of Jesus walking on the water and the disciples in this great storm on the Sea of Galilee. John now kind of backtracks a little bit here and wants to see what is happening with the crowd, the crowd that has been left on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. On the next day, being the day after the feeding of the 5,000 had occurred, we read that the members of the crowd were inquiring as to where the disciples and where Jesus had gone. And from Mark's Gospel account, we know two key details here. Firstly, that Jesus sent his disciples away immediately after the feeding of the 5,000, Mark 6.45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And as indicated in John 6.22, Jesus had not gone with them. Instead, he had gone to the mountainside to pray, Mark 6.46. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. These details may seem insignificant. However, they tie Jesus into walking on the water. You see, he was not with the disciples when they had travelled. He was on the mountainside. He saw them from a distance. And all of these details tie together to show that the Bible self attests or in other words, the Bible backs itself up with these details because all of God's word is truth. So this little detail that Jesus wasn't with them actually backs up Mark's gospel that Jesus was on the mountainside seeing the disciples from a distance. The word of God self attests it proves itself. As it says in Psalm 119 verse 160, the sum of your word is truth. Let's continue in our passage, verse 23. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats, went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. I find verse 23 particularly fascinating. There are two ways you can read this verse. Let me explain both ways. Firstly, we recognise that the, G the, the crowd were searching for disciples and seeking Jesus. So they were possibly checking all of the inbound boats to the coast to see if the disciples or Jesus were returning to the area. 
However, I also want you to see the second element, that we recognise that these are eyewitness accounts giving us specific details of the time. John 6 is a real life moment that actually occurred. And what we read here is you get extra details of the inbound boats, potentially these details compiled by the crowd. And once again, showing us that Jesus is no figment of imagination. This is not a story that's been told to children to help them sleep in the evening. This is a real life person walking on the earth in a real life event. And these little extra details of Jesus not being in the boat and these boats coming from Tiberias, these little details begin a picture in our mind of a real life event. And when the crowd had looked everywhere, they determined that both Jesus and the disciples were no longer around. So they get into a boat and they set sail for Capernaum, which at the time it was known as the base for Jesus' ministry. It tells me understand the movement of the people here. We can see on the map that Jesus, the disciples and the crowd had been on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. First the disciples in a boat, then Jesus walking, and finally the crowd in boats head west across the Sea of Galilee to the coastal town of Capernaum. Before we move into verse 25, let's not miss this wonderful detail at the end of verse 24. The crowd were seeking Jesus. Now we are not told what they were seeking. All we're told is they knew who it was they were seeking. They were seeking Jesus. And what we're going to find out as we go through this passage is exactly the reason why they were looking for him. So let's uh, continue towards verse 25. And as we go into verse 25 onwards, we begin a new section in John's Gospel. And it's known as the discourse or the teaching, the discussion of the bread of life. And it runs from verse 25 all the way through to verse 71. And the discourse is split into several sections and we're going to look at two very specific sections today. The first is the, the questioning of Jesus and the subsequent lack of faith in Jesus, verses 25 to 29. And then we're going to look at the call of Jesus to have faith in him as the life giver. And that's verses 30 to 34. So keeping in mind this crowd searching for Jesus, getting in a boat, seeking Jesus on the other side, and keeping in mind the upcoming teaching on the bread of life, we now go into verse 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now the crowd arrive in Capernaum and find Jesus, and this is not necessarily difficult. It is quite well known that Jesus was followed by many and there were always a crowd following Jesus. So it's not hard to believe that they got to the coast and found Jesus fairly quickly. But when the crowd get close enough to Jesus, they ask a very specific question. When did you get here? Verse 25 is what we call a scene setting verse. Let me just say that again. Verse 25 is what we call a scene setting verse. Yes, there's details in the verse itself, but it speaks about what is coming next. So the detail that we have here is that the people saw Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher that they would follow. And then they give an earthly question of his arrival time. And in setting the scene, notice what is happening below the surface here. They are thinking on an earthly level, not an eternal level. They're thinking about sail times, how Jesus got across the water, how quickly he managed to do it, rather than asking eternal questions like, how is it possible that you can make all this food in a miracle? How is it possible that you speak with such authority? They are thinking earthly, sailing times, rather than thinking eternal, the power of Jesus. And so this scene is set that this crowd is now in front of Jesus, they're asking earthly questions, and Jesus launches verse 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus is challenging the motivations of the crowd here. They say they seek Jesus, but they are seeking Jesus because they had their fill of food. You see, Jesus sees right through their motivations. They seek Jesus because they want their fill again, rather than because they have seen some form of divine authority before them. 
The crowd were labouring to find food, earthly food, and Jesus points out the error of their ways. They are still thinking on an earthly perspective rather than an eternal perspective. Jesus showed them their, their thinking is flawed for what it was because the great significant offering that Jesus was giving was an eternal life. For Jesus hadn't come to condemn the world, he had come to save the world. He had come paving a way of a new relationship with God the Father. So it wasn't about ritual keeping and this kind of warped pharisaical uh, rule keeping. It would be about faith in Jesus that brings new life, eternal life for the people. The people didn't see that because they were thinking earthly about sale times and about bread rather than about eternal things. And we read that the Father had sealed on Jesus. He had placed a seal on him and it's possibly referring back to his baptism and the Holy Spirit appearing and, and the Father saying he's well pleased with the Son. However, I think it's more likely that we are seeing a, a great indication here of the authority of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, that he has the authority placed in him to forgive sins and to be the sacrifice for each and every lost soul. The people came looking for earthly sustenance, but Jesus was offering an eternal assurance. And it goes to show you how wrong the crowd had got Jesus. They had seen a miracle worker, but not the Messiah. Jesus conveniently fitted into what they wanted, yet they were blind to what they needed. Verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. If the people are not to seek earthly sustenance and they're not to seek signs of wonders and miracles, what are the people to do? Well, look at the response of Jesus again. To believe in Jesus who was sent by the Father. Let's not complicate this. The people are to seek Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Faith in Jesus is the answer and will always be the answer. There is nothing that people can do, nothing on this earth that they can seek that will save them. Only faith in Jesus will save a sinner. Only faith in Jesus will make you whole again. Only faith in Jesus will bring you new life. Alistair McGrath reminds us, faith is not something that goes against the evidence, it goes beyond it. The people needed to go beyond what they had seen. They needed to go beyond the feeding of the 5,000, beyond sale times and what Jesus had been doing, and they had to see what it truly meant, the eternal being of Jesus that would bring salvation if they placed their faith in him. They needed to go beyond what they saw and began to listen to what Jesus was saying. However, even with all these wonderful truths before them, the crowd still didn't get it. Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? You know, our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Sign after sign, wonder after wonder, Jesus had shown who he was. Yet this was still not enough for the people. They demanded another sign, something more spectacular than before so that they would believe. And notice, this is the incredible thing, they are still thinking about food. Because if God had fed the ancestors with manna throughout the whole of the wilderness, surely Jesus could do that again and give them food on a daily basis. They're so blinded by their earthly need to eat that they completely miss that the Son of God stands in front of them right before their eyes. They were thinking that they needed the bread to live on this earth, but they needed their eyes open to the bread that was on offer, the bread that would last for an eternity, the assurance of salvation in Jesus. So blinded they were to this earthly thing. And just to digress on a, on a little note here, it's something that we seem to do all together, almost on a daily basis, is think about what we're going to eat. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe supper, constantly thinking about food. Let me just say this. I wonder how much we think about the word of God and about Jesus during the day. Is it the first thing you wake up to in the morning or are you thinking about the coffee you're going to have? 
Is it the last thing you think about before the evening time, before your bedtime? Or is it thinking about the supper that you're going to have? We need to elevate our thinking from the earthly to the eternal. That's not to say that we're not to eat food. It's to say that we need to be constantly inquiring unto Jesus, not unto earthly things, so that we live for him, not on this earthly focus. Verse 32. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The focus should not be on the bread, but on the one who provides it. The father is the star of the Old Testament, not the manna and not Moses, for it's the father that sustained the people. Jesus is the focus, not the bread, the eternal, not the earthly. Jesus offers as a free gift life to those who would place their faith in him. As it says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, brings new life as the only way to the Father and the only truth to believe in. Verse 34, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. The people are still not thinking on an eternal perspective. Jesus has already said that this bread that he offers is new life and is given by what? Faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus. Yet the people wanted something tangible, something to touch, something to feel. They hadn't really engaged their brains yet. They were still thinking of their stomachs when they needed to think with a soul perspective. They needed to think with an elevated thought, not their hunger pains, but their spiritual pains of being far from God. Remember, these are Galileans. They've come across from the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So what they have really grown up with is being against the Jewish people. They would have been at odds with the Jewish people. They would have heard rituals and rules and, and God's chosen people. And here they have the offer of free life, the offer of the Son of God and the Messiah. And all they see is food. And when is Jesus going to perform another miracle? For now, I want to stop there and I want us to begin to apply this passage to our own lives. Remember, we never just want to have understanding of the passage because then we would just simply have an academic faith. It's great to study the word of God, great to have knowledge of the word of God, even better to apply that knowledge to your life, to take the wisdom of God's word so that we would become more like Jesus every day, being transformed, being sanctified to become more like Jesus every day. So here are just a few things to consider as we kind of take the passage and apply it to the, our lives. Let me ask you one question here. What are you seeking? I want to be very clear. I'm not asking who you are seeking. I'm asking what you are seeking. The crowd wanted food. They then wanted a sign. They had limited interest in who Jesus was, only interest that he could give them what they had wanted. So I ask again, what are you wanting? What are you seeking? What do you want from life? Is it financial security? Are you hoping for a better house? Are you wanting to feel happier? What is it that you are looking for? I used to work in London, in the financial district of London, and during a period of my life, I would honestly say what I wanted was success and a large bonus. That's what I was driving for. I was a Christian believer in Christ, loved Jesus, served Jesus. He was my all, yet in my job, I wanted success and a big bonus. What is it that you are looking for? What is it that you want? The truth is we are all looking for satisfaction in this life. We all want something. When I lived in London and I wanted success, it's because I wanted a promotion and I wanted a big bonus, it's because I wanted a better place to live in. We want satisfaction because we're not happy with what we have, we want something else. And this could be something uh, that is better or this could be something that is a change. Oswald Chambers says this, the man or woman who does not know God demands an infinite satisfaction from other human beings which they cannot give and in the case of the man he becomes tyrannical and cruel. It springs from this one thing, the human heart must have satisfaction.
But there is only one being who can satisfy the last abyss of the human heart, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The heart is always wanting, but it will only ever be satisfied by Jesus. You might be looking for your marriage to be better, or your kids to be better behaved, or a new job, or or a change in life. Perhaps we are all seeking some form of meaning in this COVID-19 time. Perhaps we're all seeking for changes or the ability to visit or the ability to hug one another or the ability to sing in church. Perhaps we're always wanting something. But let me be clear, we only find satisfaction in Jesus. Isaiah 58 verse 11, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Or consider Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, whoever has it rests satisfied. Let me humbly just encourage you to stop searching and pursuing earthly satisfaction. It is not going to give it to you. You will be like the crowd, seeking something that doesn't happen, doesn't exist, doesn't give you what you are looking for. Give up searching for something on this earthly perspective. You might say, hey, I want a better job. Well, guess what? When you get that better job, you're going to want something that's maybe a better work-life balance. Or maybe you want a better marriage. But let me tell you, there's always trials in marriage and always trials in parenting. So that's going to be a continual thing you look for. Maybe you want uh, the ability to have success and have wealth and change your life. Let me tell you this. There will never be enough success, never be enough money to satisfy your heart longing because we were created by God, by the breath of God, the Ruah of God that gave us new life and we will only ever be satisfied when we return to Jesus and focus on him. And so let me say this, that you need to stop pursuing earthly satisfaction. Pursue Jesus for he will bring you joy. He will satisfy your heart. If you're struggling like the crowd to get through life, my guess is that you have stopped taking in Jesus and are taking in too much of this world. Lift your eyes off the earthly and look to the eternal because it is in the eternal that we find new life. Don't pursue satisfaction in this world. You will be left wanting. Pursue Jesus and your very soul will be satisfied. My second thing I want to ask you is this. Are you listening? Are you listening? The crowd asked questions. Jesus answered the questions. The crowd continued with the the exact same questions. Jesus answered their questions. And the crowd continued the exact same thinking. They were not listening. They just wanted what they wanted. And that leads me to ask you this question. Are you listening to God? Is there ever a better time to ask this question? We keep talking about lockdown and and the suffering of it and the changes we've had to make and the stress of it and all the rules and all the regulations. When was the last time you just sat still and listened to God? Not Boris Johnson on the news, not the local MP, not the latest risk assessment policy, but God. Just listen to him. Not with a prejudice of, I think God is saying this, but just listening to God. Psalm 25 verses 4 to 5. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Notice the words of this verse. Not tell me your ways, but make me know your ways. Not show me your ways, but teach me your paths. I will wait all day long for the Lord to do this. I think when we read the psalmist there, and I think what's happening with the crowds, is listening is not just about hearing. It's not just about hearing words. It's about taking those words and preaching them to your soul. The psalmist often says, praise O my soul, the Lord. Let me say this, we need to take the words of God and and place it in our soul, place it in our hearts so we're listening to God. I think it's really interesting at this time that we can so often be like the crowd. We know what we want and like a child, we keep asking, we keep demanding until we get it. Yet that is not the mark of the Christian. 
The mark of the Christian is to rest in the knowledge of God, that he knows what he is doing and that we won't always get to know. We won't always get to see the next step in the plan, but we rest and we wait on the Lord for his ways are perfect. His timing is perfect. And in him, we find complete assurance that the God that knows all things has each step planned out. So if I can encourage you, number one, to seek Jesus, pursue Jesus. Number two, when you do so, listen. It's not just about running after Jesus, reading a few words and then getting back into the world. It's being still enough to listen to what God is saying without preconceived ideas, without prejudice, just listening before the holy God and hearing what he is saying in this moment in our lives and in the life of the church. Thirdly, I want to just finish with this question. Do you know Jesus? Let me conclude with the gospel of Jesus, for this is the matter of the passage. The people sought after Jesus for bread, for food. They were seeking the wrong thing because what was on offer was the gospel of Jesus. What was on offer is that we are sinful people. We are wretched, we are wicked. When we even try to do things good for a couple of days, we fail. Within two or three days, we immediately go back to sin. And if we don't, and we think we're puffed up and we're great, we will fall into pride, which is sin. And we keep going into this trap. We see it throughout the whole Bible. People are wicked. But God, while we were still sinners, sent Jesus Christ to take our sins on the cross, to be a living sacrifice so that his wrath would be poured onto Jesus, not onto us. And as it's poured onto Jesus and he takes our sins, our sins are then crushed, defeated, destroyed. And so now when we place our faith in the cross of Christ, when we place our faith in Jesus, we will see our sins being destroyed. We will repent being so captivated by Jesus, we repent, we turn away from the bad things we're doing, the wrong things we're doing, the sin we commit against God, and we humbly bow before Jesus and say, you are Lord, you are Saviour, you have taken my sins and set me free, and you will find forgiveness because God is merciful and gracious that when we place our faith in Jesus and we repent from the old ways, he will forgive our sins and he will set us free into new life as a new creation. And so if I can conclude with this this week, whatever you are seeking, if it is not the gospel of Jesus, it won't satisfy you. And when you turn your eyes toward Jesus and you begin to find that satisfaction in him, know this, don't just make it an academic thing. Don't just ask questions. Know what Jesus has done for you. Know that he has went to the cross for you. Know that each one of you have an opportunity right now to bow before him and to become a Christian. And how do you become a Christian? You place your faith in Jesus. You repent from your sins. You seek forgiveness from Jesus. And then you jump with joy and praise to the Lord God for he is faithful and just to forgive your sins, set you free, for you will now be a child of God and a co-heir to the throne of Jesus. Don't be like the crowd today. Don't miss what is so obviously in front of you. See Jesus, pursue him, be satisfied in him. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for John. We thank you that he meticulously wrote this gospel account. We thank you that we can now read it and we can see the mistakes of the crowd, the, the blindness of the crowd. We can see the faithfulness of Jesus. We can see the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus. We can understand salvation in him. We can understand eternal life. And so, Father, we praise you for we know that this book is truth, this word is Jesus himself. And so, Father, we praise you for Jesus. We pray for each and every one that's listened to this sermon. We pray that they would know you, pursue you, and be satisfied in you. And Father, when we begin to err and we begin to think this world has the answers, pull us back, drag us back if you have to, Father, because we want to live in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, bless us as we seek you and pursue you this week. We pray this in the gracious and precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to connect with us, you can do that via Facebook or by emailing us at info at grimsbybaptistchurch.co.uk. We hope you'll be able to join us again next week on Sunday, either at church at 10.30 or online. And also the prayer meeting on Wednesday, again, either at church or online. Don't forget that to join us at church, please book using Eventbrite. I'm going to close by reading from Romans chapter 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless.